Welcome to part four of the Gospel Revolution Seminar. And I reiterate again that the gospel has all too often got second, third, or fourth billing. Uh, we study so many topics, but the gospel has been forgotten, and so we want to bring back the gospel because it is the power of God. Uh, so there's no such thing as not having the power of God when you have the gospel. And so in our first session, we, we, first two sessions, we talked about the good news of what God has already done uh, for believers. And then in the second se third session, we began to go to John chapter 16, and we begin to look at the world and the gospel for the world and how the Holy Spirit works with the world. And gratefully, Jesus gave a very, very concise teaching about it. Now, we didn't get so far, so we're going to continue there because I just covered a couple of those verses, and we're going very high. Have a wonderful time. This might rattle your cage. This might uh, turn your theology upside down. This might turn your practice upside down. I hope so because I'm here to, to, to see the gospel come in focus. If you want to see miracles... If you want to see healings and wonders, they follow the gospel. And so get good at the gospel. That's the message that, that Jesus gave to the world. And so uh, let's look at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. John 16, and he says, when he, verse 8, when he comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So, so that, that's where we started. There's three points. And last, in session four, we only cover the first, convicting concerning sin. Uh, big, uh, and verse nine said, concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Greek word is hamashia. It means missing the mark. That's where the world and religion is missing the mark. They think that they can, by a certain ritualistic observance or following certain uh, prescribed religious rules, they can deal with their sin by self-effort. Uh, but here the Holy Spirit is telling the world that it's only by believing in Jesus. So we don't say deal with your sin. We say Jesus already dealt with your sin. Deal with Jesus. Let him come and live big inside of you. And that's how the Holy Spirit works. So if we want to be in sync, work with the Holy Spirit, that's our message. Even when we are overwhelmed and furious and angry and we see all the sin and we see crime being committed and we say, how can this be? Because that's often where Christians go wrong. They get so aggravated by it. It's so sinful. It's never been as bad as now they say, which really isn't true because it's been bad many times in history. And they say, we, we've got to tell the world to stop sinning. So they, 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 they want the right thing, and they go about it by, by starting to finger wag and say, I tell you, you better deal with this and stop this. But it doesn't work because God's way of dealing with human sin is that Jesus Christ took our sins, became the Lamb of God, and put away the sins of the world. And so when we are flowing with the Holy Spirit, we want people's lives to be changed and, and be, be new, in fact, not just change, but get a new life. That, then it is by preaching the gospel and saying, come to Jesus. So we, but, but I'm not going to re-preach last week. Uh, that's enough. Then it said, Go back to verse 8. The Holy Spirit will convict of righteousness. Notice that. Now, what does that mean? Well, gratefully, you don't have to take Peter Youngren's word for it because Jesus himself explains what he meant when he said that. And, and notice, first of all, it doesn't say that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of unrighteousness, i.e., you are not righteous enough. No, the Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness. And whenever the Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness, it's not of your self-effort righteousness. It is Christ's righteousness because our righteousness is as filthy rags. So what is it? In verse 11, Jesus, uh, verse 10, Jesus clarifies it. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. 
So that's what the Holy Spirit is busy telling the world. Let's break it down. The Holy Spirit is busy persuading the world that Jesus Christ has gone to the Father and you see him no more. You say, well, how does that, how does that convince anybody of righteousness? Well, hold on. So we got to dig a little deeper. Got to go a little bit, you know, below the surface and find out what does that mean? Well, the rest of Scripture is there amplifying that. In fact, last week I, I quoted from 1 John chapter 2, and I'll go there again. And I said to you, I'm going to come back to that. And now I am coming back to that, just like I said. It says like this, my little children, I am, verse 1, I write these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. Remember, he says the Holy Spirit will convict the world of righteousness because I go to the Father. Here it says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. So he has gone to be with the Father. And so where is my righteousness right now? My righteousness is seated at the right hand of the Father. And if my heart condemns me, as John spoke about, if I start feeling condemned, it doesn't improve my life. It doesn't make me holy by saying, oh, I feel that I should just condemn myself. It's a good thing to feel a little bit condemned and you kind of feel like I need to beat myself up. No, that doesn't make you righteous, but instead you are reminded of the fact that Jesus Christ has become my righteousness. You're reminded of who you really are. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul wrote to us. Uh, I, I've been made righteous. You're, this is Bible psychology. Religious psychology is tell people how bad they are. Tell people what they are not so that they will pull themselves up by the bootstraps and try to become what they are not. But Bible, gospel psychology is to tell people who they really are in Christ. So that you say, well, how can you tell somebody who's just done something wrong that, that Christ, their righteousness, is at the right hand of the Father and that, that Christ is their righteousness? Shouldn't you rebuke them? It would seem that I should just let them have it, grind their nose in it, just, 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 you know, keep them down, keep them in the dirt, keep telling them what low lives they are, how bad they are, how could you? You're a Christian. How could you do such a thing? It would seem from a religious perspective that that might do the job. They'll get them to to, to really take a stand and change and, and, you know, leave them down there in the dirt for as long as possible till they, till they learn their lesson. Yeah, till they learn. But see, that's not God's psychology. God says if the righteous could even fall seven times, God raises him up. Why is that? Because God doesn't want his righteous one to get used to the mire and the muck and the dirt. So he raises them up quickly. Religion says, stay there to learn your lesson. But the lesson they learn is, maybe this is where I belong. But the lesson we learn by practicing what the Holy Spirit does, we say, no, I don't belong in the dirt. I'm not that person. I'm a new creation. And so what happens as you begin to share this with people is not that they get a license to sin as some erroneously accused uh, the Apostle Paul of producing. You know, people say, well, I guess Christ is our righteousness. We'll just keep sinning. He says, certainly not. Some people may say that of someone like myself. Oh, no, no, we don't take sin lightly. We, we, we take sin very heavy. Sin is very terrible. My little children don't sin. Sin is a heavy thing. See, people who think that you can make yourself holy by your own effort, they don't take sin serious enough. They think, well, if you just follow these five steps, you will break this addiction, you will break this sin, do this, do this, do this, do this. They don't realize how powerful sin is. They're giving you false hope saying, well, if you just do these things, you will break it, you will break it. And then they do those things. And then they become disappointed. I did it and it lasted for a few days, but then I fell back in the same thing. I get back into the same trouble. And so, but we take sin very serious. Sin is heavy. Sin is powerful. 
If you get in a boxing match with sin, oh, you may get a couple of blows in, but in the end, you're the one who's going to land up on the, end up on the canvas because sin is powerful. If sin wasn't so powerful, then Jesus would not have needed to come and take our sin. If we, by a religious methodology and by a prescribed set of rules, could make ourselves righteous, then there was no need for Christ to come. That, that's why Paul says, you know, if righteousness comes by your own effort, then Christ died in vain. What's the point of the whole thing? What's the point of the cross? If a mere study, if a mere lesson, if a mere um, course, education could change you, if that could do it, then Christ died in vain. Forget the whole thing. Forget the old rugged cross. Forget it. If you, but, but, but see, the, the powerful truth of the gospel is that Christ has made you righteous. And when we preach that to people, even in their face of condemnation, something happens. Faith comes by hearing. The word of Jesus Christ. And it's like, boom, something happens. And they say, well, if I am the righteousness of God in Christ, I'm going to live like that. I'm not going to be jealous. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to gossip. I, I'm not gonna, because that's not me. That's not me. That was me trying to prove that I'm something big and important and trying to boost my own ego. But that's not me because I, I'm a a joint heir with Jesus Christ. See, see, that's why it says, uh, this is Bible psychology. The Holy Spirit wants people to be righteous. I want people to be righteous. You probably, if you're watching me, you probably want people to live righteous. And maybe very sincerely, you've been thinking, if I point out all their faults, if I point out all their failures, that'll straighten them out. That, you, you know, you just got to tell it like it is. Tell it like it is. I think I told you before, people say, well, tell the truth. The truth will set you free. And then I say to people, well, if, if you think the truth about your sin will set you free, please tell everybody about your sins. If, if you think you telling the truth about your sins is, is what Jesus is referencing as the truth that will set you free, well, go and tell everybody your sins. Go and announce them. I don't have many takers. What sets us free is not the truth of our own sin and our own failures. What sets us free is the truth, capital T, of the one who said, I am the truth. Let me just give you one more verse. Uh, Romans 5, 17, famous verse. But it, it's, it, I'm glad it's a famous verse because it's a powerful verse. It says, if by the transgression of the one, death reigned, through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And so do we want people to reign in life? I mean, that would indicate uh, overcoming temptations, overcoming uh, negative forces. Do, is that what we want? I, I think that's what I want for myself. That's what I want for everybody who I'm able to influence. So how do we get people to experience that? Because there are Christians who say, well, I, I'm living a defeated, defeated life, but I'm holding on. So what's the answer? It says abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. So two things. If you want people to reign in life, abundance of grace. Let's look at that for a moment. Because some people say, well, you don't want too much grace, you know. You don't want too much grace. You know, we got to keep a balance. And then some people say, well, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so they say, we need to have a balance. You know, it's like, a, like one of these balance uh, TD totter, we call them. I don't know what they call them where you live. And so, so, so you say, we need, to have, we need to have grace, but we need to have truth. And, and they say that truth is you know, telling people about their sins. But that's not really what the scripture says at all. The scripture says that Jesus is the truth. Grace came by Jesus. And so grace is what God has done for us, giving us favor. The truth is the message of what he's done. So we need that he did it. And then we need the truth proclaimed. We proclaim the truth of what he did. There's no contradiction so that you have grace on one side and holiness and, 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 and telling the truth about people's sins on the others. They work together and they make you righteous. So abundance of grace. 
That is why the story of the prodigal son is so powerful when he came home and reportedly, although he didn't admit it, his father didn't say so, reportedly he had been with prostitutes wasting his money. He had had all those things happen. That was the older brother who reported that. But the father hugged him and kissed him. And Jesus is saying, that's who God is. That's how you restore a person. You see, if the older brother, imagine for a moment, just play with me. You know the story in Luke 15. If, if the father was there waiting for the prodigal to come home, Imagine if the father had not been waiting. Imagine if the older brother would have been waiting. That he was a self-righteous saying, I served the father. I'd never got anything. I, he, he was one of these really religious types. Imagine if he had stood there and the younger son would have come and said, oh, I've sinned against heaven. He would have said, yeah, you have. <laughs> yeah, you have. Don't you think you're going to forget it either? Don't you think you're going to be called a son? Yeah. He said, oh, give me a job. I want to, this one of the lowly servants. Yeah, you're going to give you a worse job. We're going to give you, we're going to teach you a lesson. And maybe in a few years you can graduate to a little bit better job. No. See, that, that's how religion meets people. But the father he just gives them hugs and kisses because the father doesn't want an employee. He doesn't want a servant. He wants his son back. And that's the gospel. You are a son and daughter of the Most High. You are created in the image of God. And that's why God doesn't browbeat you. And that's why God's methodology is not beating you up. Because you, frankly, most people beat themselves up. People are pretty good at beating themselves up. For all their sins and everything they've done wrong, they beat themselves up. People are good at that. And so you come to God, you don't get another beating. You get the heavenly father's arms wide open and hugs and kisses. And that's how you reign in life, through this abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. So it's a gift. Well, when something is a gift, don't try to pay for it. It, it just, it's an insult. If I, if I brought you a gift... Even if it was a small gift. We have a production crew here that is helping me do this. So if I went, you know, we like coffee. And so if I went and bought a coffee and I said, I want to give you all a coffee because I love you so much. I haven't been doing that for a long time. Maybe I should. And then they said, well, well let, let me pay you something for it. I would say that's almost insulting. I, I, it's not such a big deal. You, 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 I'm giving it to you. And so to try to pay for the righteousness when it's a gift, it's like God is saying, what, what's wrong with you? You're trying to pay for something I'm giving you? Receive it. And by receiving it, this is miraculous. You reign in life. You find yourself, you rise up and you say, well, I'm not the person I used to be. I used to fall for everything and every temptation came my way. I'm just gone, you know. But I said, something has happened. I begin to realize who I am. I'm a new creation in Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of. And the world needs to hear this because the world is full of uh, their own performance, whether it's spinning prayer wheels in one religion, bowing down, kissing statues, going to shrines, going to holy places, pilgrimages, sacrifices, self-berating, uh, whatever it is. Religion is full of effort. But the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. Christ is your righteousness. So if you're a Holy Spirit-aligned believer, you don't remind people of their unrighteousness thinking that'll help them. You remind them of that Christ is their righteousness. Oh, thank God. Okay, I got to move on now. I'm still in John. <laughs> I got to move on. Otherwise, we have to take another session on this. But I want to get to this John 16. Okay, the Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of, of, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Well, what judgment are we talking about here? Well, I'm glad Jesus told us which judgment it is. So we don't need to have a discussion. Uh, th this is not talking about some eternal judgment. We're not even going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what Jesus talked about. He says, verse 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. 
also referred to the prince of this age. Actually, the word age is better there, the Greek word aeon. The ruler of this age, because really the earth is the Lord's, the world that all that is in it. So uh, sometimes the word aeon in the Greek, which means uh, age, has been wrongly translated as world. So the prince of this age, the ruler of this age, he has been defeated. It's referring to Satan, the devil. So this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. He is convincing the world that the devil has been defeated. Now I'm going to just take the gloves off here. And I'm going to just start with the Christian church. A lot of Christians are really focused on the devil. Now, depending on different parts of the world where you're watching, there's different degrees of this. But it can be right here where I'm speaking from today, Toronto. It can be Europe. It can be Southeast Asia. It can be Africa. People are very devil conscious. And it's not just Christians. When I first came to Indonesia, I used to, sometimes I go into a hotel room and, and, and the TV was on and they're having some kind of a sitcom or something. I didn't know what they were doing. It was just in the Indonesian language. But there were, there were people acting like demonic roles. And I said to some of them, are, are, are they depicting evil spirits? And they said, yeah. People are very evil spirit conscious. Um, I was staying in a, in a hotel in a Buddhist city just a few weeks ago and, and, and there were statues there and I was studying it and, 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 and this was all about uh, giving offerings to, to spirit beings that otherwise would be displeased. But this is not just something for the non-Christian world. I find Christians are very devil conscious. For example, in some parts of the world, hopefully not where you live, you know what pastors do? I'm talking about Spirit-filled pastors, they spend 20, 30 minutes every Sunday prior to the church meeting beginning casting demons out of their church auditorium. Imagine such a thing. They are screaming and yelling, devil, come out of this place. And then they start the service. In fact, then some of them have a Sunday night service and so they go home for lunch and dinner and they meet again Sunday evening and they do it again. Same thing, cast the devil out again. Now, that is really glorifying the devil, making the devil seem very powerful because the people, you know, they are smart. They think, well, the devil must be so powerful. Our pastor casts him out for 20 minutes Sunday morning and then we go for a little bit of a rest and the devil comes back by Sunday night. So he's just sneaking into the church. He's living here all the time. They go through this week after week, midweek Wednesday night service, uh, year after year, same thing. No wonder you people in your congregation think the devil is powerful and that the pastor is a little weakling, sissified person. Obviously, he, he needs to spend so much time on the devil. So much time on that. Where is that in the Bible? I mean, that's glorifying the devil. That's making people think the devil is so powerful, so great. You know, I have people, we had one particular festival, and in some places we go, people think they need to do this. Sometimes, you know, we don't understand the language. Many places I go, I don't understand the language, but, but I have our team alerted because before the festival starts, and talking about it in a stadium, we notice, I said, let me know, because I'm usually not there till later, you know, I come a little bit later once the service has started, but before it starts, there can be thousands of people, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, Christians, just secular people who come to the stadium, and there's some preaching is up, and, he, and he's screaming and yelling. So I say to my coworker, find out what he's saying, why is somebody up there yelling? He sounds like an angry man. And they said, oh, he's driving the demons out. I said, what are people in this city going to think? They think that demons are filled the stadium. And even if they had, what would be the big deal? Because the devil is defeated. I tell you that this is paranoia. This is glorifying the devil. This is playing into the devil's hands. He wants nothing more than for us to think that he's so powerful. He's so, he's so powerful. You know, don't mess with that. He's so powerful. That's a lie. Matthew 28, Jesus said, all authority 
in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples. How much authority did Jesus say he has? All. That means 100%. How much authority does that leave for the devil? Zero percent. I know you get the math. You, you, you see, oh, some places I go in the world, people say to me, oh, let me talk to you. Let me talk to you. And they look very spiritual and spooky. And they say, you know, can you feel the demonic oppression here? Can you feel it? And they want me to say, oh, yeah, I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Because then they'll think I'm very spiritual. Oh, he's feeling things. So I said, uh, I don't feel it. I don't feel demons. Demons feel me. I don't feel them. I feel Jesus. I feel the Holy Spirit. I don't go around sniffing. Well, well, you know, well then they get disappointed. See, see, so if you come from a church situation where none of this relates, hallelujah, thank God that you don't need this teaching, except you might need it, you know, to help others because you probably come across others uh, so you, you can get some ammunition for that. If you come from that kind of a setting, I say, be careful, think about your ways. I want to give you something to think about here about this. You know, it says in Hebrews 2, 14, that Jesus, through his victory, brought the devil to naught. That's the message of the Holy Spirit, to nothing. What does it say here? Different, he, he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Well, in the King James, it says in the old one, they brought him to naught. Naught is an old English word that means zero, zippo, nothing. He brought the devil to nothing. Oh, that's, that's, what, that, that's the message. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying. People say, oh, they get spooky. He said, the Holy Spirit has shown me all the demonic powers. No, he doesn't show you demonic powers. He shows you Jesus. There's not a scripture verse that says the Holy Spirit is showing demonic evil powers to people. He reminds you of Jesus Christ, brings to your remembrance of things concerning Jesus Christ. Okay, let, let, let me just go to Colossians chapter 2 for a moment. Let, let's just keep hitting this point. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. That's all the religious requirements. And they were hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So that's, that's what it says. So, so our transgressions, forgiven, our sins have been canceled whatever religious rules that we fell short of, they'd be nailed to the cross. And then it says, when he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So, so, so you can look at it this way. So the devil, and we're talking about a personification of evil here. He had bullets. What were those bullets? They are little bullets that remind you of your sins and failures. So when, when you get too happy and too joyous in Christ, he, he fires those bullets reminding you, yeah, but you did this. And you did that. And you did the other thing. And you get all depressed. Oh, I'm no good. But you say, here it says, Jesus Christ, he put that away. And by doing that, he disarmed every principality of power. So that means the devil, when he fires his gun at you, it just goes click, 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 because he has no bullet. He has no bullet. Jesus took the bullets. He just has a pretend guy. He must well have a plastic toy gun, you know, water pistol. Not even that. He has no ammunition. Jesus, he, he triumphed over him. And to really understand this, we have to understand a little bit about the Middle Eastern culture and the Roman culture especially. You know, when Rome was under attack, one of the, one of the you say, the mandates of a Roman emperor or Roman consul was to keep Rome protected, to guard Rome. That's why they did a lot of wars. They went out and fought wars so that no army would come against Rome. The citizens of Rome would be protected and they would be safe. But sometimes rumors reached Rome. They said, there's a powerful army and, and, you know, they're winning some battles. And so what they wanted to do, and this is kind of cruel, but stay with me, they would capture the king or the general that was coming against Rome. And they wouldn't want to kill him because they wanted to bring him back to Rome in a parade. 
parade him on the streets in a cage so people could see, look at that one. That's the guy we heard of who's so powerful, such a warrior. And sometimes, reportedly, they would cut off his thumb because they, people knew that if you, if you don't have a thumb, you can't grab a sword. And they cut off his right toe so he couldn't run, couldn't really lead anymore. And people would taunt him and say, oh, now look at that. That was, a, that was a tour of triumph. That was really showing that general will never rise up and threaten you again. He is forever defeated. And here it says, Jesus Christ, let me read it again. He made a public display, triumphing over every evil principality and power. And this conjures up that image of the victory parade through the streets of Rome. In other words, you can look at evil and the powers of evil that they are defeated and they will never rise again. Look at what Jesus did. He triumphed. That's why in the book of Colossians, Paul addresses this topic. He says, it's laughable, people. It's laughable to be afraid of the devil because after all, the devil was an angel called Lucifer created by God. So he says he's a created being who chose to become the devil. God didn't create the devil. I didn't say that, but he created an angel who chose to become the devil. And he, he, there's no threat here. Jesus has triumphed over that. I, I, I hope you're getting this. So we make such a big, big deal about it. You know, I, I like to tell the story. Many years ago, I was in the city of Karnul, India. And I, I was preaching. So usually we would start on a Sunday night in those days and then preach every night till the next Sunday night. A primarily Hindu city. In the city of Karnul, they had many different temples. And they also had monkey temples. They worshiped the monkey, the monkey, 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 the monkey temples everywhere. And uh, on the Monday night, I got up to preach. And there was this man, he was dressed so nice. He looked like a Western man, but he was of Indian descent. But he had a gray suit, a little vest underneath and a tie. And suddenly he starts acting like a monkey. I'm talking about, have you seen chimpanzees in the zoo? They kind of have long arms and kind of look like they flail in slow motion when they grab another branch. He was doing like that, and he was screaming. And he was running towards me on the platform, screaming. And I didn't know what he screamed, so I said to the translator, what's he saying to me? He says, the translator says, he's screaming to you, you are a thief. I thought, I'm a thief? He says, you're a thief. You've come to steal my people. In other words, there was a spiritual message there. And this man, he was very skinny, very slim man, he was throwing people. And some of my ushers were trying to stop him, you know, big, kind of more muscly kind of guys. And, and somehow he just knocked him down. You know what happened to me? For about 30 seconds, I forgot Jesus. I'm glad it was only for 30 seconds. Because I was thinking, oh, what am I going to do? I need more ushers. And I can look, at where, where are the rest of the ushers? Well, the ushers are already being knocked down. So he's coming, down, he's coming up, running through the crowd. He comes up. He's actually on the top of the platform. And then I remember Jesus. I remember Jesus. I thought, what, what am I looking for? Worship leaders and ushers? And I said, in Jesus' name, stop. And he fell over. He just fell over and lay there. So I continued the service. I preached. Invited people to receive Christ, prayed for the sick. People came and gave testimonies. They had to, the ones who came up on that side of the platform had to climb over this guy's body. He just still love it lying there in his gray suit, just lying there lifeless. So I was kind of feeling jubilant. This is wonderful. Everything is going good. Let him lie there. But then I got to the end of the service and I thought, uh, I hope he didn't die. That would look bad in the newspaper. A dead man found on the festival platform. So I went over. And I brought the translator with me. And when I got over there, stood right by him. He rolled over and he looked at me. And he said in his own language, I need Jesus. What I'm saying is this. I forgot who I am in Christ. 
And, and my point is, is the Holy Spirit reminded me of Jesus. Once he reminded me of Jesus, that battle was over. And I feel like a lot of churches need to be reminded of the victory of Jesus because they haven't only forgotten Jesus for 30 seconds. They've forgotten the victory of Jesus and the defeat of the devil. They've forgotten it. And they keep going through this motion again and again and again and again and make themselves look foolish. So I'm here to remind you, we, oh, this is the message of the Holy Spirit. This is beautiful. Okay, some of you are thinking, well, you're thinking, what about Ephesians chapter 6? Doesn't that say that we're supposed to keep wrestling with the devil? I'm so glad you asked, because let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. <laughs> now, if you were thinking of that, Galatians, Ephesians 6, and, and if you know the Bible, you know where I'm going with that. Well, you may not know where I'm going with it, but you know the passage of Scripture I'm referring to, uh, Ephesians chapter 6 where it's, it, it says, I'm just going to read it, what it says here. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Notice, first of all, the word stand. You will notice that word coming back several times. Then he says, stand against what? Against the schemes of the devil. In the King James, it says the wiles of the devil. Uh, some translation says trickery of the devil. So that is what the devil is engaged in, trickery, schemes, wiles. It's not a word we use so much. He's, he's scheming to deceive people. That, that is, he's the great deceiver, it says in the book of Revelation. And he's gone out to deceive many. So that is the one weapon he has is deceiving. Deceiving nice, spirit-filled Christians to think that he still has a lot of power that they need to fight against. We're not fighting against the devil. We are fighting against his trickery. We stand against the schemes, the trickery. Like, I mean, a trickery is, let's just say, if you... You, you know, uh, someone leads you on a wild goose chase. You, you want to find the direction to a place that's, that's, you know, a kilometer down the road, and they lead you on a goose chase that takes you 500 kilometers around till you get there. That's trickery. And, and that's, that, that's what the, the, the devil says. You need to defeat me first. You need to, you need to deal with me first. And only then, only then you can, you can get with My friend, that's foolishness. Let, let, let me read more here. And so then it says, uh, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It certainly isn't. But rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. What are these forces doing? Deceiving. They're doing trickery. And we stand against that. How do we stand against it? We put on the full armor of God. And, and, and then it says, so we resist in the evil day, having done everything we stand firm. And then it says in verse 14 again, stand firm. And then it gives us a description of the spiritual armor. You, let, me, let me take it from the head to the toes. You wear the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. You have a belt of truth. Your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you have the shield of faith. Now look at that for a moment. So you're dressed in the helmet of salvation. Who is our salvation? Jesus Christ. You have a breastplate of righteousness. Who is our righteousness? Jesus Christ. You have the belt of truth. Who said, I am the truth? Jesus Christ. You are, you, you have, your feet are shod with the gospel of peace. Who is the Prince of Peace? Jesus Christ. You have the sword of the Spirit, and this is referring to that little short sword that a Roman soldier had, which is the Word of God, of whom it is says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, Jesus Christ. And you take the shield of faith. Who is the author and finisher of faith? Jesus Christ. So what is that a picture of? It's a picture of a believer dressed in Jesus Christ. And what do we do? We stand. Nowhere does it say attack or tear down the devil. We're going to tear his kingdom down. No, you're not going to do that. Jesus already did that. So why doesn't it say attack? Why doesn't it say run forward, ready for battle? Why doesn't it say that? 
because Jesus already won the battle. Our job is to stand in the victory that he's done. Notice all the weapons here are defensive. Helmet is a defensive weapon. Breastplate, belt, shoes, shield, even that short little, short little sword of the Roman soldier that is depicted here is a defensive weapon. So we are not charging forward to tear the devil down, even though there's a popular song that says that. We're not going to the enemy's camp. We're not going there. Jesus went to the enemy's camp and he took back everything the devil stole from us. And I stand in his victory. Stand in it. Why is there no bow and arrow of the spirit or a spear of the spirit? Why are these weapons not there? Well, a spear is used, you throw it at the enemy and then you run forward to take more land. Or a bow and arrow, you fire that at the enemy, and then you run forward. But you see, there's nothing to run forward for. That would indicate that there's more left to be conquered. The picture we have here is that Jesus has defeated the devil. He has brought us victory, and we stand in his victory. And if there's any contrary voice, we fight the good fight of faith. And we say, no, we don't believe you lie. No, we poke with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God about Jesus Christ. We say, no, we don't believe you lie. We don't believe what you're saying. We don't put up with that. We stand in Christ's victory. Oh, praise God. I tell you, let me finish with a story because I have so much to say on this. Sometimes a story uh, can help. I was in a certain place, place in Australia a number of years ago, and there was a leadership meeting, about 3,000 people, about 1,000 of them were pastors. And there was a particularly missionary there, and he had, I was a speaker, he had asked uh, um, the, the committee leading if, if he could meet with me, and, and uh, I wasn't all that anxious, I don't know why, usually I'm a nice person to meet with people, but maybe I could smell a rat, I don't know. Uh, and so finally I said, okay, let him come. So this missionary comes. He's a missionary to Mozambique. And he wants to meet with me. He says how much he's loved me and he wants to hear from me and receive from me. Except he doesn't hardly give me a moment to say anything because he's talking the whole time. And he's talking about the vision he has for Mozambique. And let me tell you, it was one complicated vision. First of all, he says, you know, God, don't blame this on God, but he did. Maybe he didn't know any better. He says, first, number one, we are trying to find all the demons in Mozambique. We're traveling from district to district, finding the demons and naming them. And I'm just sitting there biting my tongue, drinking coffee, trying to keep, keep my mouth quiet. And I said, he said, and then after we've done that and we've spent the last two years finding the demons, after that, he said, we are establishing, uh, we're going to drive them out. Oh, I said, so you haven't even started that yet. No, that's going to come after we find them all. I said, what are you going to do then? Then we're going to establish prayer centers that keep the demons out. It sounds complicated. I said, what are you going to do then? Then we're going to preach the gospel. What a self-glorifying, self-exalting statement. In other words, Jesus, we're going to clean up the country for you because your gospel isn't very powerful. So after we cleaned everything up, you, we can get going with the gospel. The gospel is the power. And I'm listening to this. I'm a little bit uh, getting agitated in my spirit. So finally, I said to this missionary, I don't believe a word you told me. You're a disgrace. I hope anybody who sent money to your ministry stops sending it because you shouldn't be a missionary. Traveling around finding demons. My goodness. Philip went to Samaria and shook the whole city. He didn't even know that there was a witch doctor sitting on the platform. So that means you don't need to know the name of the local witch doctor or the local demon. You need to know the name of the Savior, <laughs> the name of Jesus. He preached Christ. I said, this is foolish. Half the country will be dead by the time you have come up with names for demons, whatever you call them, mumbo jumbo bada bumbo or something. They come up with these names and, 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 and great theories. And then you, I said, this is foolishness. This is not the book of Acts. This is some uh, theorist uh, preacher, hopefully not from America, but it could be, who's come up with this uh, complicated scheme. 
Instead of believing what it says, all authority has been given to me. Go therefore. He didn't say, first, go through all this rigmarole and find this and do this and have prayer centers here and do this and do this. He says, all authority has been given to me. So I'm not nonchalant about it. I know that the devil's deception causes a lot of damage, causes a lot of addiction. But I am not lowering my point, myself to the point of religion because I want to work with the Holy Spirit and convince the world that the devil has been defeated. And what a message that is. To preach that to Christians. To preach that to Buddhists and to Muslims and to Hindus. Because so many groups in the world are, are fear of devils and darkness to announce that Jesus went to hell and he defeated principalities and powers. He won an everlasting victory and, and, and his victory stands forever. Ooh, that is being in sync with the Holy Spirit. And with Jesus who says, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convince the world of judgment because the ruler of this age, the prince of this age has been judged. <laughs>